Welcome to another edition of Scripture Verse by Verse, Jeremiah chapter 13, resuming our study through the Bible in verse 12. This is my fifth series going through the whole Bible in the last 38 years, and the previous four, along with this fifth one, New Testament is already done. They're all archived at the Scripture Verse by Verse website, and that is at thebibleversebyverse.com. So go there, choose, click, and listen. Bring your Bible, a hunger for God's Word, that's all you need to do. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. And Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your Word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, the uh, Israelites are in big trouble in Jeremiah's day, because they have turned away from God, they have refused to repent, even God, even though God has warned them over and over and over again for such a long time, now it's too late. The summer is over, the harvest is past, God said, and we are not saved. So, verse 12, therefore you shall speak to them this word, thus says the Lord God of Israel, Every bottle shall be filled with wine, and they shall say to you, Do we not certainly know that every bottle shall be filled with wine? So God is telling Jeremiah what to say. And he's also telling Jeremiah how the people are going to respond to what he says. There are some modern-day theologians who teach that God is in the process of of learning. He is evolving and getting smarter every day. Oh, that's very popular among some evangelicals today. He's in the process of learning. He's growing in knowledge. God is not in the process of growing and learning. He does, but according to them, he doesn't know the future. And the reason God doesn't know the future is because the future is not here yet. Um, I swear these people have never cracked open their Bible. I don't know what they read. Maybe they read other theologians who are speculating. Maybe that's how they fill their time. But if they would throw all that trash away, burn it, and stick to the written word of God, they wouldn't say such stupid, ridiculous, unbiblical things blasphemous things to suggest that God is not omnipotent and omniscient, all-knowing, all-powerful, everywhere present. Another attribute of God, he's eternal. He's above time. He, he, he is in the Garden of Eden with Adam, and he is with us today, and he is with the world right before Jesus returns. And he's here all the time at the same time because he's eternal. He's not trapped in one segment of time like you and I are. I mean, you would have to rip every page of the Word of God to come up with a theology that God doesn't know everything and that he is learning and progressing because the Bible says that God knows the beginning from the end. How about that? He knows the end from the beginning. The, in fact, the, Jesus said, I am the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And yet, these people, my goodness, prosper. And it's because the general population of Christians do not read the Word of God like they should either. Because if they did, they would... They would exit out of those churches so fast that it would make the pastor's head spin. And the people who wrote those kinds of books would go broke, which they should. And the Christian so-called bookstores that sell them would go bankrupt too, which they should. Slap the name Christian on anything and sell it at the bookstore, no matter how outrageous it might be. terrible. Jeremiah has to tell these people 
that the wineskins in the land will be filled with wine. So there must have been a good crop that year because the people are going to respond saying, yes, we don't need a revelation from God to know that. But look at verse 13. Then you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, behold, I will fill all the inhabitants of this land, even the kings that sit upon David's throne and the priests and the prophets and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with drunkenness. And I will dash them one against another, even as the fathers and the sons together, says the Lord. I will not pity nor spare nor have mercy, but destroy them. So the wine was actually symbolic. Oh, they're going to be filled with wine. They're going to live it up. They have it, so they're going to drink it. They have it, so they're going to get drunk. They're going to overindulge. Nothing wrong with having a glass of wine. You can't find a prohibition against, against all alcohol in the Bible. Sorry if that upsets you, but it's true. I mean, we could probably give a hundred reasons for not drinking alcohol. That's fine. Just don't say that the Bible forbids it. Completely, it doesn't. And I teach the Bible, so I, I don't care who that upsets. And I know it upsets a bunch of fundamentalists. <laughs> You're not a fundamentalist if you teach that. Because you've moved away from the fundamentals of Scripture. If you want to be a fundamentalist, say that wine and beer and alcoholic beverages are not completely forbidden in Scripture. But then add to it, drunkenness is. Drunkenness is a sin. Drunkenness will send you to hell like any other sin. So there's nothing wrong with having a beer, a glass of wine, or whatever, but it's wrong to overindulge to the point of drunkenness, which, of course, is what the Israelites were doing. You say, well, you see, that's the problem. You say that, that it's not prohibited completely, and then people get drunk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So why do, you, why do you not say that food is prohibited in the Bible? Go ahead, say it. We should not eat food because there are too many people that are obese and have turned, their, turned food into a god. Why don't you say that about food? You don't because you have a lot of people in your church and a lot of people that send you money that do overindulge. It's not about eating food. It's not about drinking an alcoholic beverage. It's about overindulging. That's where the sin comes in. Stick to the word of God. Don't you think God knows what he's doing when he has given us his word and said what he said? You got to improve on it or try to? You know, just remember, God says, do not take away from my word and do not add to it. So they're going to get smashed. And that's a sin. And they will experience the wine of confusion like drunks. God's people will fight each other in a panic. When judgment comes, it'll be everybody for themselves, nobody thinking about anybody else, even parents eating their own children because they'll be starving to death in the siege that will come from Babylon. Verse 15, hear you and give ear, be not proud, for the Lord has spoken. In other words, submit to the word of God. And believe the word of God, because if you don't, that's a manifestation of sinful pride. Not accepting the word of God as it is and changing it to suit your theology or whatever, or the people in your congregation or the people who listen to you or watch you. Not accepting the word of God as it is, like it or not, changing it and thinking that you can say it better than God. Like I had one I had one guy tell me one time, this is a Christian, because he went to a church that was so legalistic. They had so many rules and regu regulations. I said, none of those things are in the Bible. His response was, well, at least we go too far. <laughs> like I was supposed to pat him on the back, shake his hand and say, well, congratulations. You've added to the word of God. You go too far. Like God didn't know what he was doing when he gave it pure and simple. It's incredible to me. The ignorance of some people who call themselves Christians. 
I know it's not my fault because I've been teaching the Word of God from start to finish, Genesis through Revelation for 38 years, and I have an attitude and I haven't taken anything away. But you add to God's Word. You take away from God's Word. You are robbing God of His glory, and God deserves to be heard. Well, Jeremiah 13, verse 16 Give glory to the Lord your God before he, before he caused darkness and before your feet stumble upon the dark mountains. And while you look for light, he turn it into the shadow of death and make it gross darkness. They better humble themselves, and they have to, to avoid the severe punishments that God says are coming upon them. In other words, they have to confess their sin, and they have to begin to obey the Word of God. This is the only way to avoid God's punishment. Confess your sin and begin to obey God. The biggest part of obeying the Word of God is to repent of your sin and ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. That's the starting point. Then you start living, you start doing the right thing out of love for Jesus and what he has done for you. 17, but if you will not hear it, your, my soul shall weep in secret places for your pride, and my eyes shall weep sore and run down with tears because the Lord's flock is carried away captive. They better repent. That's their only chance. That's their only hope if they don't repent. Jeremiah says, I'm going to be doing a lot of crying because of the punishment that you will suffer for rebelling against God. Study all of God's word with me at the scripture verse by verse website found at the Bible verse by verse dot com. Choose click and listen from four complete series going through the whole Bible going on five. If you would like to be a part of scripture verse by verse, it's very simple, very easy. Pray for me and God's word. Do it right now while you're thinking about it. Write a note, post it note, right? Stick it on the refrigerator door, stick it on your bathroom mirror, any place else that you frequently go to. Pray for Mike, pray for God's word. Do it every time you're a part of this ministry. I appreciate that. Also, study God's word with me. Don't forget to do that. That's the important thing right there. Study the Word of God with me at thebibleversebyverse.com. And when you take a break, go to the front page, click the Donate button, and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead, because that also makes you a part of this ministry, and I'd appreciate that as well. Until next time, Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.